Now for Gay Conversion Therapy with Sheldon Helms. I should probably start out by asking you, oh, first of all, thank you all for having me and thank you all for coming out. Yeah, applause to you. And thank you for caring enough about this subject to come out and, and hear me yap about it. Um, I should probably begin by asking you, how many of you came here tonight to be converted? Okay. Thank you, sir. I guessed you. Um, so you can see me after, because this shit doesn't work. Just wanted to start there in full disclosure. There are enough complaints. I've given this talk for a couple of years now, and I've had to update it from time to time. I get some very interesting um, emails from people, um, some complimentary and some complaints. Um, one of the complaints was, uh, who does he think he is? And I don't know what to do with that one. Another one was, he curses too much. <laughs> so to hell with him. <laughs> um, what was the, the other one I was going to tell you about that just came last week was, um, oh, you didn't prove to me that this stuff doesn't work. And I thought, that's a valid complaint. I should probably start out by telling you that that's not the purpose of this talk. Um, if you need me to tell you that praying doesn't work, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> also, if you need me to tell you that Freudian psychotherapy doesn't work, you should never take one of my classes. Uh, because we've moved way beyond that stuff. That's the bloodletting of psychotherapy. So, no, that's not the point of this. The point of this talk is to talk to you about harm and the harm that this does to people and the harm that this does to families and the families that this creates to do harm to. So it's pretty ugly stuff. But I like to keep it kind of light, too. That's not to ridicule anyone. It's not even to ridicule religious people or people who do quack therapy. It's to kind of keep us from getting depressed about this, because you can get depressed about this pretty quickly, and rightly so. So when I was first asked to give this talk, I thought a bit about how I would start out the talk. And I thought, well, how about if I start out with a quote? And so here's my quote. It's pretty general. Um, but it's from a guy you may have heard of named Charles Darwin. And Charles Darwin says a lot of really interesting and smart things. Um, this is one of my favorites. He said, Ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. It is those who know little, not those who know much, who so positively, positively assert that this or that problem will never be solved by science. Isn't that the damn truth? And I'm gonna be honest with you, we don't know what creates sexual orientation yet. We do have some science, but that's not what this talk is about. But I will let you know that the science is falling down very hard on the side of biology. Not the TV shows that you watch, hello Teletubby fans. Not whether or not you're a believer, not how your mother treated you. Boy, have mothers really taken it on the chin from psychology over the past couple of hundred years. Do you know they used to blame mothers for schizophrenia? They called it a schizophrenogenic mothering pattern. And I thought they were up all night thinking of that word. Man, so yeah, mothers get blamed for all kinds of things, including homosexuality. So we don't know what causes heterosexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality, etc. But the evidence that we do have falls very hard on the side of science. I'm sorry, biology. Um, so uh, specifically, this talk is about harm, as I said earlier. It's about the harm that's created when we teach people that an innocuous difference that they might have needs to be changed to suit the desires of a society. So uh, just to give you a little bit um, of structure for the talk, I've created an outline here for you. First, I'm going to give you a few definitions so that we're all on the same page. We know what we're talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Um, I'll also make a few common themes salient for you so that you'll be looking for them throughout the presentation. Uh, next, I'll provide a brief history of sexual orientation and religion, society, psychology, medicine, et cetera. And later, I'll tell you about the birth of two groups, uh, the two biggest and the two most harmful, Exodus International and NARTH, which stands for the National Association for Research and Therapy of Homosexuality. Acronyms are a big thing within this, by the way, so brace yourselves. Uh, the two, they are the two largest gay conversion therapy uh, organizations in the world, and I'll detail, detail how they operate, um, their perspectives about sexual orientation, and the effectiveness, or so-called effectiveness, of their cures. Also, the power that they wield in politics and in society and uh, behind the scenes, social policy especially. And lastly, I'll talk to you about uh, social activism. Um, where do we go from here? To give you a little bit of hope at the end. And uh, I used to just kind of go, let's hope. And now I have a really good story to tell you at the end. So 
prepare yourselves for that story. Um, goes by other names, too. So I'm going to be using the term gay conversion therapy over and over. But I'm talking about the same thing if you hear someone call it gay to straight therapy. Interesting, it always goes that direction, right? It's never, make me gay, then I'll know how to do my own hair or whatever. Um, it's also called reparative therapy. Remember when Barbara Walters, a few, like 20 years ago, was talking about that first gay conversion therapy guy, and the look on her face was like, you're going to make them all straight? Like, you, were, you could just tell in the back of her mind, she was thinking, save two for me. Like, my hair and makeup and my clothes. And, you're going to make them all straight, guys? Anyway, that was inappropriate, and I apologize. Um, they also have this new term that's it's so fascinating to me. They call it SOCI now, sexual orientation change efforts. That one seems to suggest that they're not really talking about cure anymore. They're like, we're trying hard to change. It's just efforts on that part. So that one's not as common, but it's SOCI. It's all the same thing here. Um, practices that seek to change one's sexual orientation, identity, and behavior from homosexual to heterosexual. Um, the methods that they use. I'm not going to go too much into detail with this, but pray the gay away is a big deal. Uh, they don't all use that, but they all use conditional social support. Um, not just social support from your friends and family, but conditional social support, meaning if you do this and you don't do that, then we love you. And the same goes for the big guy upstairs. Um, pseudo therapies, and boy, there are a lot of those, and you'll see some of them in video clips, and you will not believe your eyes and behavior modification techniques. These are possibly the most dangerous and damaging. Sexual orientation, you probably already know this, but definitions are important. An individual's pattern of physical and emotional arousal toward other persons. Uh, this can exist as heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, asexual, and some people say even other things. Uh, research on sexual orientation, as I said earlier, comes down quite clearly on the side of biology. Um, and it shows an impressive degree of stability over people's lifetimes. In other words, you're born with a sexual orientation. It's not open to change by someone else's efforts. Uh, the confusion, of course, comes in when people start to confuse sexual orientation with these things, such as behavior. Well, asexual people are people who describe themselves as not having a sexual orientation. They don't feel sexual attraction to other people. Um, nuns, ostensibly, don't have sex. That doesn't make them asexual. So behavior in their part doesn't equate always with the sexual orientation. Also identity, going around calling yourself gay, straight, bisexual, or whatever, doesn't do much to tell us anything about you. It just says what you want to be in some cases. And then sometimes you hear people talking about the gay lifestyle. Last night my husband and I were watching Star Trek, and that's apparently the gay lifestyle for yesterday. <laughs> I also did laundry, that's part of it too. I was like, what are you talking about? Um, so th that lifestyle part, by the way, is very important in the backstory of these kinds of gay conversion therapy um, histories. Um, you often hear people who I, uh, are ex-gays. That's another term. So cute. Um, ex-gays. And that's probably the most important uh, part of it. A clear message is sent that homosexuality exists as a so-called gay lifestyle or homosexual lifestyle with drinking, drugs, prostitution, sexual promiscu promiscuity, and HIV AIDS as being synonyms for being gay. Um, a lot of the leaders in these gay conversion therapy organizations have terrible experiences in their life histories um, that include these issues. And rather than seeing them as problems that stem from the non-acceptance in their families or their communities or whatever, they see them as endemic to being homosexual. And so that's part of their confusion as well. Uh, where does all this come from? Well, so sources of influence are all over the place. Uh, I don't have to preach to you all about the religious ideology that dictates how and where and when and how often you're supposed to have sex. Um, religious ideology teaches gay people that they are sinful, that they're even demonic, and that they are to be feared by other people. Uh, the medical community also is rife with uh, treating homosexual people as abnormal, psychologically damaged, and even damaging to other people and uh, as a, a preventable disease or disorder. Uh, the legal community, uh, society at large, um, you know, it may interest some of you to know, by the way, that until June of 2003, it was still illegal in 14 states in the US to be gay. And people were put in prison for this. 
Uh, it's amazing that people just kind of walk around without this kind of knowledge because it doesn't make it on the evening news the way it does for other groups. So uh, that was fought to the U.S. Supreme Court twice, by the way. And the first time back in the 80s, they said, let the states decide. So the states did decide. And some of those um, so-called sodomy laws applied to straight people as well, but they were always selectively prosecuted. So it was only ever gay people that really were put in jail. Three of the states, by the way, um, just made no bones about it. They said it's only for gay men. That's how they wrote the laws, and that's how they applied them. So, yeah, it's everywhere. Um, by the way, studies show that um, gay youth are at highest risk for suicide and homelessness, um, three to four times higher than their heterosexual counterparts. And that's a study by Cochran and Mays in 2000. Uh, they found that over 19% of their sample of gay men had attempted suicide, compared to less than 4% for their heterosexual counterparts, uh, most of that occurring before the age of 25. Uh, religious basis, remember that book? You probably haven't seen it in a while. Um, there's, there's all kinds of anti-gay messages in religion, especially in the Abrahamic religions. Um, two of them in Leviticus, they get talked about a lot. Leviticus 18 says, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. And then in 2013, they say, if a man lie with mankind as he lieth with, uh, these ifs are getting me, lieth with a woman, both of them have committed abomination. They shall surely be put to death their blood shall be upon them. Book of love. And then people will say, but that's Old Testament. That doesn't apply anymore. Jesus and the cross and the happy. And um, well, <laughs> Paul was still talking about it in 1 Corinthians. Can I get an amen? Uh, chapter 6, 9 through 10, he said, uh, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, mm -hmm. <laughs> nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So yeah, um, it might surprise some of those people that the Bible has not always been around. And there's been thousands of years without it. And there's been thousands of years of gay people. We have every reason to believe that homosexuality has existed as long as there has been humanity to have sexual orientation. And so it might surprise them to know that other people dealt with this differently. This is Nomhotep and Nankum. Uh, this is an etching that was found on a tomb. Um, and this could be, although we're not exactly sure who they were, but it could be the first a uh, gay couple in recorded history um, over 4,000 years ago. Um, interestingly, their names mean joined in life and joined in death. And they're uh, shown here in the most intimate um, pose that w could be shown by canonical Egyptian artwork of the time, which is nose to nose. They're basically macking, they're like making out. And uh, uh, they had wives and they had children, but interestingly, the pictures of the wives were like further back in the tomb and they were smaller. And the pictures of the kids were more prominent than the wives, so they had you know, people to inherit their stuff. But um, yeah, so they're adorable. Um, <laughs> we also had, um, some of you may have heard of the Burdash. That's not a word that any Indian tribe used, uh, but this is what you know, the white man used, Burdash. I think it's a French word originally. Um, this is a famous uh, Burdash of the Zuni tribe of what is now um, New Mexico, the New Mexico region. And uh, her name was Huawei. I'm sorry, Weiwa. Pardon me, Weiwa. Weiwa was chronicled by the ethnologist and anthropologist Frank Hamilton Cushing. And he noted that although she had been assigned male at birth, um, she was lucky enough to be born into the Zuni tribe. And the Zuni tribe didn't regard you as having a gender until you were older. Children were said to be achno, which means raw. And then when you're an adult, you're called chapin, which means cooked. And when you're a child, they don't know who you're going to be or what you're going to be. So they just allow you to be whatever. And then when you get to the age of puberty, you go through something called a basket or bow ceremony. And in front of God and everybody, you come out and you choose in front of everyone. And you choose either the basket or the bow. And most of the boys pick up a bow and most of the girls pick up a basket, but not Weiwa. She knew what she was. And so she picked up a basket and they were like right on Weiwa. So she got married and she lived out the rest of her life being regarded as any other female with the same rights and respect. Um, this is not true everywhere, of course. Uh, when the um, white people got here, they didn't like this at all. 
And uh, by the way, Wewa might be a better example of gender identity, I should point out, but it shows that we've been dealing with things like gender and sexuality and sex issues for a really long time. This is how Westerners dealt with it. Um, these are the war dogs owned by Balboa, and this is a famous etching of them tearing apart an Indian tribe that uh, respected the third gender. So that was not good. By the 1500s, um, things like that were dying out. Um, so that's really old history, and this isn't a history class, so let's talk about this guy. Um, when people think of psychology, that's generally their currency, Freud. They go, Oprah, Freud. That's kind of the two things they know. And I gotta kind of beat that out of them whenever they're in my classes. Um, Oprah's probably better at it than Freud, sadly. Uh, Sigmund Freud didn't have a whole lot to say about homosexuality. He did talk about sex a lot, as I'm sure you're all aware. And his psychosexual stages of development theory was you know, widely known and very influential for a really long time. About the first 100 years, he was the only game in town. Um, most of his attitudes, although he waxed and waned on homosexuality, most of his attitudes came from this guy you may not have heard of, Richard von Kraft Ebbing. And boy, was he an interesting guy. Um, he was obsessed with sex, uh, any kind of sex, and he considered all sex abnormal unless it was to have a baby. So it had to be procreational, and it had to be not too often, but just often enough, and he never told you where the sweet spot was. And so he had all these different terms for sex that was bad, and he wrote this in a big magnum opus called Psychopathia Sexualis in 1886. And as you can see there, you know, if you had at the wrong time of life, you're too old, don't be having sex, it was paradoxia. Uh, if it was not enough sexual desire, it's anesthesia, okay? Uh, if too much hypersthesia, you can imagine women got accused of that one a lot. And then there's paresthesia, which was misdirected, had all these different horrible things like pedophilia, bestiality, oh, and gay people as well. And so that's what Freud inherited, was his ideas came a lot from him at the beginning. But interestingly, as time went on and Freud changed his mind and perfected things, um, he urged that homosexuals not be segregated from mainstream society. And he actually, uh, I found a letter recently, an interesting um, copy of a letter in which a woman wrote to Freud and asked about her son who was homosexual and she wanted his help. And Freud wrote back and said, um, what analysis can do for your son runs in a different line. If he's unhappy, neurotic, torn by conflicts, inhibited in his social life, analysis may bring him harmony, peace of mind, full efficiency whether he remains homosexual or gets changed. And so that's a much sort of gentler approach to kind of saying, well, is he suffering in any way? Oh, and then he ended the letter by suggesting she might need psychoanalysis. Drop the mic. That was cool. He wasn't really saying like, because you treat your son by, he just kind of never met anybody that didn't need psychoanalysis, except himself, of course. Um, so Freud, you know, he sort of begins this conversation in psychology because he's the one that kind of invented psychology, not modern day psychology, obviously, but he's the, the guy that, he's the go-to guy for the gay conversion folks. Um, I wish they mentioned this woman more, the unfortunately named Evelyn Hooker. Uh, try hanging your hat on that every night. Um, she was a, an astounding person. Um, she unfortunately, you know, considering the time period that she lived in, she was a Freudian. Um, but she uh, was one of those kick-ass women that kind of said, well, Freud didn't get everything right. And one of the things he didn't get right was homosexuality. And she said, I know this because most of my friends are gay men. She was actually a member of the Mattachine Society, which was the early 20th century first gay rights group in America, or one of the first in the world. And uh, most of her friends were gay men. And she kept hearing her fellow um, psychologists saying things like, well, they're all crazy. Like, they're all neurotic, and they're all suicidal. And she said, who are these people? And they said, our clients. And she said, well, what about the ones who aren't your clients? And they said, oh, we don't meet them. And she said, well, duh, then. Like, I do, and I meet a lot of gay men that their only problem is people like you. So she decided to do a study on this, and it's a groundbreaking study, and it's surprising no one had thought of this before. She ended up collecting the um, psychological workups of over 60 men. 30 of them were heterosexual men, and the other half or so were gay men. And she had the psychological workups done, and they were all printed out on paper, typed up real neat, no names, no identifying markers on them. Mixed them all up and handed them out to psychologists top name psychologists and said, figure out which ones are gay and which ones aren't. 
And as you probably guessed already, they couldn't do it. There were no identifying factors whatsoever. So gay and straight subjects were indistinguishable from each other. And people were astonished by this. They couldn't believe it. And I believe it got replicated one time. Now keep that in mind as we move on to this guy. This is Dr. Robert Spitzer. And he was a psychiatrist who was the chair of the task force of the third edition of the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the Bible of psychotherapy, if you will. Um, and he was a Columbia University professor of psychiatry, and um, in 1973, he ruled against inclusion of homosexuality in the new, the third edition of uh, the DSM. And this was an explosive decision. Um, he used two things to make that decision. One of them was Evelyn Hooker's research and uh, the replications and others like it. So lots of research to back it up. And also he did something that most psychiatrists didn't do at the time when they were on these kinds of governing boards. He went out and talked to the people that were concerned about this, including gay men and women. And they convinced him, along with the research, that it did not deserve to be included as a mental disorder, which it's astonishing in 21st century to think in those terms, at least it is for me, I hope it is for you, that you would think that just because someone's gay, they're, they're mentally disturbed in some way, rather than seeing it as, well, maybe if they're disturbed at all, it's because of the way people treat them and the laws and the society. And so, um, unfortunately, it wasn't a perfect situation, though, because he did add in this sort of ego dystonic thing where he said, if there's distress and impairment of functioning, though, then that's, that's disturbing, you know, that's probably disorder. So it wasn't perfect. He didn't just erase it completely, but he came real close. And so, um, yeah, that was his ruling. And uh, so s imagine our surprise when um, only about 30 years later, the same Dr. Robert Spitzer shows up in the literature in the archives of sexual behavior uh, with a study in which he claims that he found gay men and lesbians who, through therapy, could change their sexual orientation. I was like, what? This is like Richard Dawkins coming here and going, I found Jesus, y'all. And you would all go, what? You'd expect him to rip the mask off, right? And he'd say, oh, yeah, this was really disheartening. And, of course, people attacked immediately, and they said it was scooped up by anti-gay groups in instantly. You can imagine, like, focus on the family and exodus you'll meet in a minute, and they all put it on their websites, and it's still on their websites, prominently displayed. Even the great Dr. Robert Spitzer knows that you choose your sexual orientation, and it can change. You just need the right therapist and all that. And uh, he later apologized for this study. And he said that he made an error. Now, the error would be obvious to, I'm sure, all of you. It would be obvious to my Psych 101 students. Guess how he measured whether or not they had changed their sexual orientation? He asked them, can you imagine? It's, I mean, for a lot of things, you go, self-report's fine. It's like, oh, how tall are you? Or what color is your hair? Or what color is your hair, really? You know, That kind of thing. People will generally tell you the truth. But you've got people who are coming to you and saying, I want to change my sexual orientation. Why would you ever trust their self-report? Their, their desire would be so overwhelming that they might even trick themselves, let alone the person doing the psychotherapy. He should have seen that coming. Um, he did apologize, but you know, that's, that's really uh, too little too late. Uh, because even though he apologized and asked for a retraction, I don't think they retracted it, it doesn't matter. Because people will read this on their websites anyway, and they won't read the retractions. So uh, what's done is done. Um, two of the groups that grab that up the quickest are the two I'm going to concentrate on tonight. They are Exodus International and NARTH. They are um, very big, uh, very powerful organizations with many millions of dollars to back them up and a lot of press. Uh, one of them, Exodus, is primarily a religious organization. NARTH pisses me off more because now they're on my turf. This is the National Association for Research and Therapy of Homosexuality. These are real psychologists and psychiatrists, y'all. They are actual therapists, many of whom are licensed, at least at the beginning. Some of them get their licenses pulled, but they're people who have no excuse whatsoever. I can almost understand, if not forgive, a person who is guided by religion getting involved in this sort of thing. But a person who has taken advanced courses in research methods and the scientific method has no excuse whatsoever in believing in this sort of thing. So out of the two, you may choose Exodus to be upset with. I choose North every time because that 
I don't know, it just step in, steps on my turf. So let me tell you first about Exodus. Founded in 1976. I don't have time to go into all the details, but ironically, it was because one of the men, Michael Bussey, called a suicide hotline because he was thinking of killing himself because he was so distraught over being gay. And that phone call to a suicide hotline ended up taking him to a church where he would eventually found Exodus International and do more harm than you could imagine. Uh, founders were Michael Bussey and Gary Cooper, also Frank Worthen, Ron Dennis, and George Reed. Their methods were very simple at the beginning. It was be a good Christian, pray the gay away. They started adding in pseudo-counseling later on, often by people who had no business doing counseling. Did you know that um, if you are a licensed person doing counseling, there are governing boards and there are laws that keep your ethics sound. But if you get yourself some kind of a recognition as a reverend or a pastor or a priest or something, you can do the same psychotherapy. There's no governing board. There's no laws that apply to you. I mean, unless you're, you know, stabbing someone or something, there's nobody that can touch you. And that's really unfortunate. We need to fix that in America. There are also these bizarre all-male retreats. <laughs> you would think, you know, if you're an alcoholic, they don't take you to a bar. So if you're... And language counseling, where they actually tell you you want to be straight. All right, call each other dude and bro. Wow, okay. I know, <laughs> how to join Delta Phi or whatever. Yeah, uh, so Exodus is really old. Um, they make no bones about the fact that they're a religious organization. Their mission statement is this, mobilizing the body of Christ to minister grace and truth to a world impacted by homosexuality. I'm still confused about how it's impacting people, but there it is. Uh, they are very well-funded and very successful. Founded in 1976, they ended up with over 120 local ministries in the U.S. and Canada, 150 worldwide, and 17 other countries. Um, millions of dollars involved here. Um, you may remember two of their founders, Michael Bussey and Gary Cooper, I mentioned earlier. Um, they were the faces of the ex-gay movement. They were the first ones on the scene. And as part of their ministry and organizational responsibilities, they traveled around the world to share the hope of salvation from homosexuality. To save money, ostensibly, they would stay in hotel rooms together. They became very close. Here, you see it coming, don't you? You smell it. You yeah. Um, so uh, maybe too close because uh, by 1979, they had dropped out of Exodus altogether. Here they are at their commitment ceremony. Bum, 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 bum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Gary Cooper is, has passed away since then, but uh, here is Michael Bussey to tell you a little bit about the so-called success of this organization that he saw in the several years that he founded it. I'm Michael Bussey. I'm one of the original co-founders of Exodus International. I left the program in 1979 and have since reconciled my spirituality and my sexuality. Now I'm a vocal critic of reparative therapy programs and of Exodus International. When you were a leader at Exodus, did you ever have people report that they had changed? Did you believe that anyone was even changing? I had many people report that they had changed or were changing. Not so much that they had changed in past tense, but that they were in the process of change, that they were becoming more and more heterosexual or that they were becoming, more often that they were becoming less and less homosexual, they were becoming sort of asexual. So I had people who claimed that they had changed. I never believed it. Never really believed it. Wanted to believe it. But I never really saw it happening. I never saw one of our members or other Exodus leaders or other Exodus members become heterosexual. So deep down, I knew that it wasn't true. So that's one of the founders telling you that deep down he realized pe this was not working. People were not becoming heterosexual. Um, in some cases, they became less and less interested in sex. And that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because again, it's the behavior that they're looking at, not the orientation, just 
Are you, are you not having sex anymore with people of the same sex? Yay, win, check it off. We wouldn't call that success. So Michael Bussey and Gary Cooper, they're out of there, right? So they need new leadership. And they found it in the form of this guy, John Polk. Now, Polk is an even sadder story. Um, Polk spent his young adulthood hanging out in bars and doing drag under the name Candy, whatever. Um, you know, some of my best friends are drag queens. They don't look like him, though. Um, he also worked as a gay escort when he got really desperate, and he was, you know, basically a prostitute and prostituting himself and, and um, addicted to drugs and alcohol, and that was the reason for his prostitution. Um, so, of course, he again goes to the gay lifestyle being the problem, so he joined a church ministry and went through Exodus's gay conversion program and apparently was very successful at it, or at least it seemed like it on the surface. And they hooked him up with this woman, Anne, who is an ex-lesbian, because there are female ex-gays, too. <laughs> And so they're like, great, you look like a great couple together, get married. So they did. And in 1995, he was elected chairman of the board of Exodus International North America for a three-year term. And they loved him. They couldn't get enough of him. And he was really good with the press, so much so that he ended up on the cover of Newsweek magazine with his bride there. Um, uh, he was re-elected in 1998, and he toured the country speaking of his conversion at their so-called Love One Out conferences. Now, that's an important term, by the way, Love One Out, because later on, my friend Wayne Bezin creates something called Truth Wins Out, and it's sort of a stick in the eye to the Love One Out group. Um, Polk and his wife became the faces of Exodus Ministries and promotional materials and national publications, and here's their 1998 Newsweek cover from August of that year um, when they did a story about the ex-gay movement. Now, here's the gossipy part. In September of 2000, my friend Wayne Bezin was asleep, like you do at 10, a, at 10 p.m. or whatever, and his friend called him up and said, you've got to come down to Mr. P's right away. This is a gay bar in Washington. And Wayne's like, I'm not coming down to Mr. P's in the middle of the night. And they said, no, you're not going to believe who's here. <laughs> John Polk, and he's picking up on the bartender. And so Wayne jumps into his sweats and grabs, this is the, year, you know, the time before like smartphones and stuff, so he grabs a disposable camera and he looks at it and there's three pictures left on it. Remember film? <laughs> <laughs> Different world, kids. And so he just puts on whatever and he hurries down there as fast as he can and he bursts through the door and he said, on second thought I should have like sauntered in and Paul looks up and recognizes him and makes a head for the back door through the kitchen. There's no back door at Mr. P's. So he's in the kitchen and like, get out of here. So he runs back out. And as he runs past, uh, Wayne takes a picture of his shoe. <laughs> like, Damn it. One shot gone. He's got two left, right? So he chases after him, and the guy, you know, Paul gets out the door, and then Wayne chases down the street and tries to take another picture. It turned out to be this blurry mess. So now he's down to one photo, right? Oh. We're so lucky to have smartphones now. You'd just be filming the whole thing, wouldn't you? And so as Polk is running down the street, and it almost breaks my heart, he's apologizing. <laughs> and he's saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please. No, don't take my picture. But he did. There it is. <laughs> and so it looks enough like him that Exodus is like, what the what? What are you doing down at a gay bar? So he said, I didn't know it was a gay bar. And they're like... All those men didn't tip you off. <laughs> and the bartender says you were flirting with him. And he was like, well, I had a moment of weakness. And I'm really sorry. And Jesus and stuff. And they said no. So they fired him. They got rid of him. So he was no longer. Uh, and now he's like, yeah, I hate those gay conversion people. Like, no, Paul, no, too late. You're not one of us. He's, uh, apparently, he's quite a successful chef now, though, so he's got his thing going on, whatever, but um, no, I'm not going to accept him as one of us. So he got fired, and they needed new leadership, so they found it through this guy. This is going to get repetitious. This is Alan Chambers. He's an ex-gay. Here's his ex-gay wife, and Alan Chambers? This face is very familiar. Grinder, maybe? Oh, from you? Oh, I don't know. Yep. That's how they pair him up. <laughs> Alan Chambers uses another name? Yeah. We got to talk, Larry. I got to find out. Maybe it's Juicy. <laughs> I don't know. 
Um, so Alan Chambers, he was their new leadership, and yet again, he was an ex-gay, married to an ex-lesbian, and a few years ago, um, he tried to sort of up their media presence by appearing on Lisa Ling's Our America, which is a program that's produced by Oprah Winfrey's channel, and it's very popular, and um, she asked him some pretty hard questions, and she's got this really, she's very smart, I don't know if you know who Lisa Ling is, but she's very smart, and she's really gentle at the same time, which is like a bad combination for him, because she came at him with these like scissor like precision questions and he would be caught off guard each time and um, he had to think about those issues later like after it was over with he said I watched it and I started feeling really anxious and really bad and really guilty and so he asked her to come back and do another program and he she did and he announced we're shutting down because of the program that you did and the questions that you asked me, and I had to really think and like you know be introspective, I've decided that um, gay conversion therapy doesn't work, that it's damaging to people, and so we're shutting down. And so she asked him a few more questions, and I'm going to show you the most important ones right now. And I love the one at the end, because I know the answer even if he doesn't. So here's Lisa Ling asking Alan Chambers in the second interview a couple of those pertinent questions. So what motivated the decision to stop reparative therapy? The vast majority of people that I've met would say that there is some level of struggle or temptation or attraction that's resident there, whether it's a little or a lot. And I don't know whether someone can say that therapy changes that. You know, as I began to see and hear things that really disturbed and troubled me, I began to, to really share honestly within the membership of Exodus, hey, this is what I see going on. And about seven months ago, I was very, very clear with, with our leadership in saying, we're going to have to move away from this type of, of therapy because I just don't... Um, think that we can refer people to something that, that could be detrimental to them. Alan, you've been married to Leslie for how many years? Um, almost 15. Almost 15, and you have two beautiful children. Mm -hmm. Would you say you're heter heterosexual? I have to be honest and say, of course I have temptations. Of course I have attractions related to um, the same sex. But for over 15 years since I've been in relationship with Leslie, my attraction has been towards her. My devotion has been towards her. It's, uh, someone asked me the other day, are you stuck in this marriage? I'm not stuck in a marriage, I chose this marriage. She is the object of my desire. She is the object of my affection. I, I wouldn't choose anything or anyone else but her. And so am I heterosexual? I don't know. I do. That should be an easy question, don't you think? Are you, am I, are you heterosexual? And he talks for like 20 minutes around it, and then, I don't know. No, you're not, Alan. Um, so yeah, I got so many emails after that announcement. You have no idea. I mean, just from all over the place, every email account. They're shutting down. Isn't that great? They're shutting down. And I went, ah. Oh. I don't know, let's wait and see. Because, you know, these people are wily and there's a lot of money on the line and money, woo, if you think religion motivates people, money motivates people even more. So uh, yeah, if you go to the website now, at first you would find all these announcements, yay, shutting down, shutting down. That was the term, shutting down. But when I typed in their URL, it was still there. And I thought, if you're shutting down, wouldn't you shut down? Like, get rid of the website, get rid of all of it, right? So after a few weeks, this is what showed up. We're rebranding. Now it's called Speak Love. And of course, there's a donation page at the beginning and all of that stuff. After about a year, it's still not shut down. Now when you go there, it's called alanchambers.com. And there he is with his wife. And the first thing that pops up is, buy my book. It's all about his experiences with Exodus, etc. The money's still rolling in. 
Exodus still exists, I guarantee you they are still doing gay conversion therapy. Do I have evidence of that? No, I don't. But I do have a working brain. And I know when that much money is coming in, they're not going to shut down. It's not going to happen. So they're still around. We'll just have to play wait and see and see what this turns into. He was confronted on that same show with about a dozen people who had gone through Exodus International under his auspices and others, and they weren't having it. They asked some really pointed questions, and he danced around every one of them and wouldn't say what they were going to become. But interestingly, he did say, there will still be people like me, though, who don't want to live a homosexual life, and they want to get married, and we're there for them. And they said, so you're now a recloseting organization? Is that what you are? And he wouldn't answer that question either. So it's still not shut down, and you know, the clock's ticking. Remember, James Randi had the Sylvia Brown countdown, and it was a timer because she said she would take the test, the million dollar challenge, and she never did. So we should probably have the Exodus countdown as well. Um, this is the other organization, the really big one, um, NARTH. As I said earlier, it's uh, the National Association for Research and Therapy of Homosexuality, founded in 1992 by Joseph Nicolosi. Uh, that's this guy. And here's one of his quotes, and I have to agree with this quote. I really do. Let's take a look at it. He said, The fact that so many men continue to feel diseased by their homosexuality can be explained in one of two ways. Either society and the Judeo-Christian ethic have coerced these individuals into thinking they have a problem, or the homosexual condition itself is inherently problematic. I totally agree with him. Except I believe it's the highlighted one that's the problem, and he believes it's the non-highlighted option. So he spoke the truth accidentally. Um, Nicolosi is a real piece of work. Uh, he um, helped found this organization in Encino, along with a few other people who are psychotherapists. They're trained just like any other psychologist, psychiatrist in some cases, um, so they have no excuse whatsoever. They are partially motivated by religious ideology, but partially not. Partially, it's simply that they see homosexuality as being pathology. They also make some really big logical fallacies. I know you guys are probably big on logical fallacies, and we'll get there in a moment. Um, I want to tell you about another guy, though. This is kind of gossipy, too, so, you know, take it for what it's worth. Uh, this is George Rakers. Uh, Rakers is a psychologist and a Southern Baptist minister. He's also the founder of the Family Research Council. Uh, yeah, it's a huge anti-gay group. They stole the word family. That sucks. Because anytime you see the word family in an organization these days, it means we don't like the gays. Like gay people don't have families, right? They come out of eggs or whatever. It's ridiculous. So yeah, um, he had to resign from the board of North in 2010 because of one photograph. It's, it's a great photo. I'll show you in a moment. Um, he was in an airport with a young man a young man that was a fraction of his age. Uh, that's not a big deal, you know. What do they call that? May-December romances? Great. Knock yourself out. The, the difficulty here is that he's an anti-gay person, and he got this guy from rentboy.com. <laughs> Giovanni Roman is his name, and they went to Europe together for three weeks. Raker said, you got it all wrong. He, I hired him to carry my bags. See? See Rakers having the other guy carry his bags? No. He's not. He's carrying them himself. Uh, Giovanni was asked, and he said, oh, I gave him nude massages. He was totally honest about it. And Rakers said, no, I took him there to minister to him, to make him not gay anymore, and right? And they went, no, you got to go. So they fired him. So they got him off the board and they erased him from their website and all of that. So he's another, you know, winning North member. Um, when you ask these North folks uh, where their psychology comes from, they go back a really long way. When my students write a course paper for me, uh, like a real research paper, I say nothing more than five to seven years old because it's too old. These guys go back over a century to these three dudes. This is Jung, I'm sorry, Freud, Jung, and Adler. Uh, Freud was the first guy. Uh, Freud is kind of like psychology on cocaine. Um, Jung is psychology on LSD. It's just like doo doo, wacko. And then Adler, sad. Um, they say, uh, but they were all anti gay way back then. So what about that? Well, you, 
already recognize, obviously, that this is an appeal to authority. Just because people from, who are really you know, popular or powerful or famous or rich or whatever say something doesn't make it so. You need evidence, right? So they say, well, but we've believed this for a really long time. You know, over a century of psychology has said homosexuality is pathology. Sorry, that's an appeal to antiquity. Just because something's really, really old, like acupuncture or something like that, or bloodletting or whatever, doesn't make it true necessarily. So these are really weak claims that are impressive to the layperson. Because if you say something like, yeah, but most of psychology and the big names, and they go, oh, okay, well, what do I know? And they go along with you. But not people like me. Like, I've taken a couple of classes in this stuff, you know? And I see right through this. Um, but, you know, they're not coming after people like me. They're coming after everyday folks. So here's a little, I apologize for this. I'm going to make you watch Nicolosi talk about it. Um, he's going to talk a little bit about it and let you know what he thinks about homosexuality. Not only is the APA changing now, but APA changed before 1973. We have to understand, if we're going to follow the words of the APA, then we have to consider that before 1973, homosexuality was always a disorder. Always a disorder. The three greats in psychology, Jung, Freud, and Adler, the three greats, all saw homosexuality as a disorder. But, and, and it has been consistently seen as a disorder until one day in 1973. What happened on that day? Was there a big scientific meeting? Was there an understanding of new evidence? No, there was no new evidence presented. Suddenly it was a political decision. And so in one day, 150 years of literature was wiped away. What a schmuck, right? I mean, he's, he's so stupid. He says, was there a big meeting? Yeah, there was. It was a huge meeting. Like, everybody was there. <laughs> How are you not there? And then he says, you know, uh, th was there new evidence? Yeah, there was new evidence. Like, Wikipedia, dude, you could look this up. It's very easy to look up. But again, he's speaking, speaking to his own people, right? This is people who go to their website and they listen to this guy as an authority figure and, and he's just wrong. Uh, you want to see one of their graduates? Here you go. Uh, this is Richard Cohn. He is the president of the International Healing Foundation. And you have to say it like that, International Healing Foundation, because <laughs> that's how they talk. Um, uh, he has a really sad history, by the way. He's a huge proponent and popularizer of holding therapy and bioenergetics. Yeah, someone knows about holding therapy. <laughs> um, so he, he was raised in, in a, he was raised Jewish, uh, but he ended up having Jesus save him, which is interesting. Um, he was raised in a household where he says he had an abusive father and an overbearing mother and very distant relationships. Interestingly, I found out recently they didn't have any problem with his homosexuality. Um, they were totally accepting of him. So he had no excuse whatsoever, but he did. And so he, he lived this sort of conflicted life of going out, you know, and having gay friends and gay relationships and all this stuff, but all the time hating himself for it. So he found solace. He went out and he found a group that would accept him. They're called the Moonies. Yeah, he joined the Unification Church of the Reverend Sun Young Moon. Wow, he went a long way, right? <laughs> And um, so he joined up, and uh, the Reverend Moon arranged a marriage for him, found a woman, and this poor woman married him. And um, later on, he joined the Wesleyan healing community, and he sort of mixed the two together, but he wanted to become a psychologist, a psychotherapist anyway. So he joined NARTH, and he learned all of the principles of NARTH from Nicolosi and his ilk. And uh, he's been married for over 25 years now. He has several children with this woman. Uh, he believes he was healed of his homosexuality through psychotherapy as well as with Jesus' love. And he's the author of um, several books. You guys, I should get some kind of award for reading this shit. <laughs> really. I mean, please don't buy him in his books and don't read it because better my brain should be poisoned than yours. Um, straight parents, gay children. Keeping families together. Yeah, because, you know, you couldn't be together if you were gay and you had, like, you know, parents. Um, the other one, Coming Out Straight, he wrote with that, um, that uh, moral shame factory named Dr. Laura Schlesinger. Oh. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm so sad that you guys moan, but I'm happy that when I say that with my students, they're like, who? I'm like, oh, beautiful. Yeah, you don't know who she is. She's just a waste of skin. Um, <laughs> 
Most horrifyingly, though, he also wrote this book called Alfie's Home. Alfie's Home is a children's book. Not meaning it's about children, it's for children. So people buy this and give it to their kids. And they read all about where homosexuality comes from. It comes from your mother. Yeah, your mother is too overbearing. And so you become so like her, I guess, that you ended up attracted to men. Um, yeah, and then it's the opposite for lesbians, obviously. Oh, there's another place where um, homosexuality comes from, too. Uncles who molest you. Yeah, so there's a little story in there about this boy getting molested, and it's their special secret, and you know. So they're, again, equating pedophilia and homosexuality, as they often do. Um, so this is nonsensical. It's dangerous. It perpetuates the, the myth that homosexuals are pedophiles. Homosexuals are far less likely to be pedophiles than heterosexual men, by the way. No offense, guys, but it's true. Um, so, yeah, Richard Cohn, he's, he's interesting. Here he is with his wife discussing his theory about homosexuality and what you should do about it. Say hi to TV land. Hi. <laughs> How long have you been married? 23,000 years. <laughs> so simple science demonstrates that opposites attract. If you have a positive charge and a negative charge, I have actually magnets in the, in the garage. They look we have a <laughs> south good. and a north. And a north and a south, what's going to happen? Opposites attract. They love each other. They yes. love it, baby. They love it. Okay. Let's flip this around. We got two north and two south. What's going to happen? Repel. Wah, 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 wah. You know that. <laughs> They're, they just can't do it. Okay, so what, why is a guy attracted to a guy? If opposites attract, it means he doesn't feel his guyness. He's looking to complete himself. If he felt masculine, he would say, ooh, hooking up with a guy? It's a non-sequential. But he's internally more feminine than masculine, so he needs that guy to complete him. This, this is so far out of the mainstream, it's on Mars. It's non-sexual. It establishes like parent-child relationship. So he didn't experience this growing up with his dad. Rob, do you feel a sexual connection right now? No, I don't. I feel very safe and very comforted and um, it just feels wonderful. Another technique, bioenergetics, designed to help clients release memories stored in the muscles, in this case by hitting a pillow with a tennis racket. I was angry at my mother, so I started saying, Mom! 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 Why did you do that to me? Okay. <laughs> So, you know, with all due respect to the gentleman who was disappointed with my talk one time, um, do you really need me to tell you that this is not psychotherapy and that this doesn't change people's sexual orientation? That would be insulting to the audience. So, no, I haven't done a study on beating a pillow with a tennis racket and whether it makes you like girls. Uh, but I don't think you need me to do that either. It's just ridiculous. So um, he, uh, is, he, he was a graduate of North, and they do not like him anymore. They're like, you're too wacky even for us. Uh, so his frequent appearances on TV, including the Paula Zahn uh, interview that you saw there and a mocking piece on The Daily Show you should look up, um, have resulted in uh, other ex-gay organizations removing him from leadership and distancing themselves from him and removing all references to Cohn from their website. And they fired him from the presidency of a group called PFOX, which kind of makes fun of PFLAG. Um, he's not a licensed therapist anymore. Here's how he gets away with it. He operates the International Healing Foundation as a 501c3 nonprofit. And then he asks people not to pay him, but instead to give a donation to the charity. So it's tax deductible, and also he gets to keep the money, and he doesn't have to go by any legal standards or any ethical standards by the APA. In fact, the American Counseling Association and the American Psychological Association both banned him for life for ethical violations which included things like tricking some of his clients into being in promotional materials and videos and things like that. So he's banned forever, um, which is good, but still he's making a lot of money doing this and selling a lot of books. 
Um, he doesn't use aversion therapy, but many other groups do. So I'll just touch upon this quickly. Um, aversion is kind of the opposite of seduction. So when you're seduced, you're drawn towards something. Aversion means you're, you know, back away from it. Um, aversion therapy um, is not generally used in psychotherapy anymore, although some of these places like uh, outpatient hospitals for drug and alcohol addiction used to use it back in the 70s and 80s. Um, they used, uh, for instance, a drug called Anabuse, which has no effect whatsoever unless you drink alcohol. And then if you drink alcohol, Alcohol, you become more sick than you've ever been in your life. I mean, people projectile vomit and la the effects last for hours as long as it's in your bloodstream. Um, so without the alcohol, it does nothing. But with the alcohol, it makes you really, really sick. And so the idea, of course, is Pavlovian. Remember Pavlov and the dogs and the bells and the salivation? So the idea here is to make you associate the nausea and the sickness and all that with the smell and taste and even in some cases the sight of alcohol. By the way, they all drink. You tell them you're gonna get really sick and they're you know, addicted, so they drink. And so the idea here is, instead of using antabuse, they'll just use Ipecac. Ipecac is um, a drug that they used to use a lot in poison control centers and things like that. So if you, you know, God forbid your kid you know, drinks, not God, but you know what I mean, um, forbid. Darwin forbid, uh, your kid drinks poison or something, you give the kid this Ipecac and they immediately start throwing up whatever is in their stomach and it can save their lives. So what they use it for here is to try to cure homosexuality. So they give it to you every 15 minutes for six hours. And you're heaving and heaving and they're showing you gay pornography at the same time, still images or videos. And so they do several of these treatments a week. So imagine six hours every other day, every 15 minutes being given a cap full of this stuff. It's just torturous. Um, this young man, uh, Sam Brenton, um, he underwent a, a similar psychotherapy, if you want to call it that. Um, his parents were itinerant preachers and they kind of traveled around with other religious people and he was homeschooled so he talked to his parents all day every day and he told uh, his parents one night at dinner this story about how some of the boys had brought a playboy magazine um, with them onto the I don't know campus they lived on or whatever and he said very proudly I told them but I must be really strong in my faith because they were looking at it and they were getting really aroused and I wasn't and his father said what and he said, I, I felt so righteous. I was so proud telling him this. And he said, but if I'm being perfectly honest, sometimes I do feel that way about my friend Dale. Dale was his best friend, and he was a boy. And he said, I remember this dark look coming over my father's face and his hands coming up toward me. And then I remember nothing until I was in the hospital. And he said, I woke up, and I had fallen down the stairs at the dinner table. And he said, I would fall down the stairs several times in the months to come. Um, finally, it got so bad that he was taken to a doctor. Now, this was a doctor who served only the ministry. And uh, he said, I was really thankful, though, because the, it looked so nice and bright and happy, and I thought, maybe we'll get to the bottom of whatever my problem is. He said, I don't even know what my problem was. So um, uh, the doctor said to him, um, so your mother can leave. So the mother left, and he said, Sam, thank God you're here um, because God is killing all the gay people and we may have gotten to you just in time. Um, you have AIDS, and if you don't allow us to cure you of your homosexuality, you're gonna die. And you're gonna go to hell, too, because God doesn't love gay people. So he was horrified by this. So this began a series of, basically, psychological and physical torture techniques that they used. Um, one of them involved um, putting blocks of ice on his hands and leaving it there while he was looking at same-sex images. This worked up to um, heated coils being wrapped around his hands, connected to a car battery, and every time they showed opposite sex couples on the screen, nothing happened, but then if they showed same sex couples, even just shaking hands or, or touching each other in any way, two men together, they would heat up the coils. Not enough to leave any scars or, or evidence, but enough to burn him really badly and hurt a lot. Kind of like when you touch a hot pan on the stove or something. And that wasn't working either, so they graduated to um, inserting needles under his fingernails and attaching those to the car battery. And so when they would show same-sex images, um, they would shock underneath the tender area underneath his fingers. And they did this for several months. Um, he said, I've forgiven my parents intellectually. Emotionally, I have a difficult time with it. Um, he said, I can't imagine what mother could sit in a hallway listening to her son scream hour after hour like this and not come in and protect him. Um, it would just seem unconscionable to me. Um, the good news is that Sam is fine today. Um, he went to college, he ended up finding gay groups, he ended up finding the Trevor Project, 
Um, he's a very successful young man, by the way. He graduated from MIT with a degree in nuclear engineering. He's currently working on perfecting some fuel cycle systems, whatever the hell those are. Um, he also speaks fluently Mandarin, Chinese, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. He's a smart guy, and he's been through a lot. Um, surprisingly, he's still a Christian, too. Um, so that's interesting psychologically to me. Um, it's also noteworthy that um, he goes out and spreads the word to other people to talk about acceptance. Um, so he's one of those good Christians who does good things. Um, not all of them are like this. Uh, in the time I have left, I want to tell you this um, horrible story that didn't turn out well at all. Um, this is Raymond Byes. Uh, Raymond Byes was taken by his parents in South Africa to Echo Wild Game Rangers camp for being, quote, too effeminate. His parents were afraid that he was gay. After two and a half months at this camp, this is what was returned to them. The hospital staff described Byes as severely malnourished, dehydrated, with two broken arms, uh, burns all over his body, and wounds. Um, he lay in intensive care for four weeks and died of his injuries. Uh, his roommate at camp said that Raymond, for some reason, was chosen by the people who ran the camp for particular torture. He was chained to his bed for extended periods, sometimes several days. Um, tortures included being forced to eat his own fecal matter. Camp leaders put a pillowcase over his head and used an electric cattle prod on his fragile body. Um, this is the monster who led the charge in doing this. Um, he and his two assistants were arrested, but then they were released by the courts with very low bail amounts. So this caused a national uproar. Um, it also caused a local police commissioner to get involved, and they uh, eventually um, not only investigated Raymond Bai's story, they also found out that the previous year two other young men had died at this camp. These were deemed heart attacks, and these young men were 19 and 18 years old. So highly unlikely. They exhumed their bodies and found that they were suffocated to death. They were strangled to death. Um, probably they should have known something was up by looking at the camp flag. Um, this, this group, uh, Alex de Coker is now in prison, by the way. This was being run as a, uh, by a conservative religious group as a paramilitary militia training camp. And they just happened to specialize on the side in making real men out of people. So it's unfortunate. Well, we can't uh, talk too broadly about um, uh, issues in South Africa, though, because the same kind of thing happens here. Um, we do have some laws that are being passed. They don't go far enough. In 2012, Ted Lieu introduced a bill that makes gay conversion uh, therapy partially illegal. You should keep in mind, however, this only applies to people under the age of 18 as clients, and it only applies to licensed professionals. So anyone who is unlicensed, who's getting uh, under the radar like Cone is, or religious organizations or whatever, this can still happen. You should also know that it's involved in our politics. You remember this guy who ran for president a while back, uh, Mitt Romney, he has given um, over $35,000 to gay conversion groups over the years, um, primarily the Massachusetts Family Institute, which uh, engages in this sort of thing. And also this woman, uh, Michelle Bachman, remember her? Crazy guys, yeah. Um, her, uh, she's totally against um, Medicaid, but she's okay with accepting the money from it. Um, she and her husband run uh, Bachman and Associates, which is a Christian counseling center, and they've received uh, annual Medicaid payments totaling over $137,000 since 2005. Um, yeah, Bachman and Associates, um, her clearly not gay husband. <laughs> Look him up, y'all. Um, uh, yeah, so he is a, uh, a marriage therapist, and um, he claimed that they would never do anything like uh, gay conversion therapy. So Wayne Bezin, who runs Truth uh, One Out, Truth Wins Out, um, sent in an undercover um, operative with a backpack with a very fancy little camera, and you can look that up on the YouTubes if you want, and uh, watch as this man clearly does not offer gay conversion therapy. Yes, he does. 
In fact, he even says that, you know, this will be really easy because God has made the man's eyes to appreciate the woman's body. And so that's, that's in you, and all we need to do is, you know, go through this therapy and pray and et cetera. So totally busted, and I'm sure that wasn't the only person that they did that with. So what do we do about it? Well, one of the things we can do is we can support groups like this. Wayne Bezin runs Truth Wins Out, and he does a fabulous job of talking about this stuff every day, and he has his own radio program, too, you can listen to online. Um, um, there are also uh, organizations like PFLAG. One of my uh, presentations, this man raised his hand. He said, what does PFLAG have to do with it? It's like, oh, man, i got to remember to connect the dots for the special ones. Um, PFLAG is Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. Parents. Who do you think is taking these kids to see these horrible psychotherapists? Their parents are. So if you support an organization that says being gay is not a pathology and you should not be embarrassed and you shouldn't be embarrassed of your children, you should, do you need us to tell you this, love your children. <laughs> So that's what PFLAG does, and uh, PFLAG is a, a very wonderful organization. If you live in California, you're really lucky because we're just littered with PFLAGs, but if you live in Oklahoma or if you live in Mississippi, it's not so great. Um, thank goodness for the internet. You know, as much as you want to say a bad about the internet, the internet also connects people in really wonderful ways. And uh, PFLAG does a great job of doing that. I also promised you that I would end with a good story. So here it is, Jonah. They're not nearly as big as the other organizations, so I don't highlight them. But I have to add them in at the end for hope because they're gone. Yay, I know. It's like it's the little successes, you know? So Jonah is the Jews offering new alternatives to homosexuality. Again, they're up all night thinking of these acronyms, right? Um, so it was uh, founded in 1999 by Elaine Burke and Arthur Goldberg. These two lovely people. Don't they look friendly? Um, they both had sons who struggled with their homosexuality and probably because of them. Goldberg is a former treasurer for Narth. Yeah, he went to work for them um, after a felony conviction involving his work as a municipal bonds manager on Wall Street, which is also the reason the APA um, uh, kicked him out and revoked his license because he lied about that. You can't have a felony and not report it. So yeah, so he said, fine, I'll start my own organization. Um, so this is a much smaller operation than Exodus or Narth, but the reason I'm bringing them up here at the end is because their fate offers us some hope. They were shut down in a very interesting way. Um, New Jersey has very strict laws about consumer fraud. They're operating in New Jersey, so let's take them to court and say their business is fraudulent. Genius! Why didn't I think of this? So they went to court, and the lead plaintiff shown here, Benjamin Unger, said that Goldberg and others at Jonah claimed a 65 to 70 percent success rate within two years of therapy with this organization. So that was a promise that they made, right? That's a consumer thing. Uh, they described, he also described bizarre therapies in which he was instructed to beat a pillow with a tennis racket. Where have we seen that before? And pretend it was his overbearing mother. Um, he also complained that that wasn't working, so they said beat it harder and more frequently. And he said, I beat it so much that I had open sores on my hands, blisters, like I was doing this concept. These are desperate people, you know, well-meaning but desperate people. Another plaintiff uh, described the pain he endured when uh, following orders to cut off all communication with his own mother. And he testified that he didn't think their relationship would survive this, that it wouldn't be the same after. So that's really, you know, painful as well. Um, in other testimony, they, uh, the plaintiffs described treatments that included being told to spend more time naked with their fathers. and you're paying for this. Uh, participating in role playing in which they were subjected to anti-gay slurs in a locker room setting, and perhaps most disturbingly, many Jonah clients described one-on-one -on -one sessions with therapists in which they were instructed to slowly remove all their clothing while standing in front of a mirror holding a staff. And some of them were also told to uh, fondle their own genitals. So in less than an hour, the jury came back with a guilty verdict and shut Jonah down. They were given eight weeks to shut down and they're gone. Yeah, so nice try, Goldberg and Burke. Um, so thank you for your kind attention. If you want to hear more of my ramblings, you can listen to my podcast, Shell Shocked. It's free. Or you can go to the Bay Area Skeptics website, baskeptics.org, and you know, I post articles there from time to time. So thank you very much for your kind attention.
Okay, we are running a little bit long, so I want us to say we'll stick to four questions, okay? And, and, and Sean will walk around with the mic if anybody has a question. And you can see me after. So you mentioned that there's a fair amount of money involved in this. Uh, who's providing this money? Donors. It's primarily individuals who, you know, church organizations, they take collections, but also, you know, of course, if you go through the psychotherapy, you can have to pay for it. And so they get foundation <laughs> grants from churches. Yeah. And, and that's where the beginning money for North came from, was religious organizations, and then they pretend to be psychologists. Oh, hi. Um, do you see parallels arising uh, for transgender care? There, it's not currently, there's no legislation preventing this type of thing being done to trans kids. No, and, and that's a really great point, and thanks for bringing that up. You know, the protections for gay people are, uh, until relatively recently, were almost non-existent. They're still almost non-existent for trans people. And uh, so, you know, they, they go after trans people probably even more harshly, and it doesn't get as much press. Uh, you know, you even see well-meaning psychotherapists who aren't a part of these so-called hate groups who say things like, well, it's probably, you know, something that's treatable, and yeah, so we're still working on even getting physicians on the right track for trans folks. So, yeah, I see a lot of parallels there and um, not much being done about it. 30 years ago, when I was in college and struggling with this kind of issue, I checked out a few of these organizations. The one that I kind of liked, uh, although I didn't really join it, was Homosexuals Anonymous with Colin Cook. Did you ever hear of him? I don't know about that one. Are they still around? No, no. Uh, I, the, the man, I, th I think, was very sincere. And, but his organization had a demise along the lines of what you were talking about. He uh, had some counseling with this guy who felt that he was holding and touching and hugging a little bit too much. And it got erect, because he was with the uh, Seventh-day Adventist church. And so the church didn't like the fact that he was kind of says, well, no, but I suppose he's got a little bit of truth there, and then they shut him down. But he was also married to a woman, and he had two sons, you know. Uh, he had a lot of issues, but he was a nice man, you know, I don't think he uh, was malicious or uh, deceitful. I just think that, like you say, you know, he came from a background that was very religious and he couldn't deal with it and that's the only solution that he could see. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you came to that conclusion that it's difficult for us to see gray. You know, so sometimes people will say, no, all these psychics, they're all charlatans. No, some of them really believe that they have these abilities. And I think that uh, this guy sounds like one of the psychotherapists who really believes he's doing good. Of course, that does nothing to assuage the damage that they do, because it's just as damaging whether they're well-meaning or not. But no, I hadn't heard of Homosexuals Anonymous. It almost sounds like a Saturday Night Live sketch. <laughs> I'll ask the last question because sure. I'm, I was just curious. When you had that first uh, couple up there, it was Gary and I forget the other gentleman's name. One of them had died. Uh, oh yeah, Michael Bussey and Gary Cooper. Yeah, yeah. So Gary had passed away. What did? How did he die? Because he died of HIV/AIDS. Oh, he died. Okay. Yeah. All right. uh, unfortunately, early in the crisis. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, I left it on a real positive note. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Brian. <laughs> just bringing it down. I was just curious. Um, so, just real quick, thank you everybody for coming. Let's thank Sheldon one last time for, for coming out.